Okay, so my name is Eric Jackson. I think I've met maybe four or five of you uh, one time or another. I kind of have been bouncing back and forth between here and Boston for most of the last 12 years. Um, quick introduction, I've been in software startups, mostly enterprise software for the last 15 years. Um, kind of going back and forth between development roles and product management roles. Um, and been back here for about a year. I'm starting a, a startup that is doing, kind of, it's called Democracy Apps, and we're, we're targeting civic engagement and finding some interesting ways to kind of interact with, with communities. Um, but I had a really weird start. Um, my first program programming task was actually on Cray 2. Uh, it was an assembly language fast Fourier transform. And that messes you up as far as kind of where you go from there. I, you know, I had a couple of simple asides. I worked in a convenience store, and I did some work in a mail room. And pretty much the rest of my career has been either these really challenging problems or these ridiculously impossible problems. Um, and along the way, I picked up a few kind of ideas about like, what you do with that. Um, so I thought I'd share those. This is all of the, the rules. We're going to do a, a you know, standard countdown. countdown. Hopefully it, it works a little better than yesterday with a rocket. Um, every one of these rules I'm actually serious about, but we're going to kind of take it in, in mostly in a lighthearted way. So, and I think the beginning is that normal people, and I'm assuming that you're not, so it's not really relevant to you, but normal people kind of already know the starting rule of this thing, which is just don't. Like, there's a door, and, and if you walk through that door, you have kind of unending misery and abject failure that is staring you in the face, and you know, you're like, okay, I'm going. You know, normal people don't do this, and if you can help it, don't. Because it is that. It's, it's kind of failure and misery, and you know, these, if you actually go into problems that are really tough, but if you're one of those people who just can't help themselves, then pay attention to the rest of this. So the first rule is you need to not be an expert. Right? This will mess you up. It will completely get in your way. Uh, before I go a little bit into why, I need to qualify myself on this. Um, so I went to the university, did a fairly standard Slavic linguistics kind of Thing. And, and because it was in the same town, that led me, uh, led me pretty naturally into doing turbulence, turbulent flow modeling. Um, and then because simulating turbulent flow uses FFTs and so do some other simulations that uh, it was pretty natural to go on into kind of optimizing computer chip design uh, with all of that preparation. Um, and from there, you know, it was, it was an easy jump over into distributed file systems. Um, because I kind of accidentally co-founded a startup in there, um, I decided I'd try business consulting. And so I did that for a little while, and because that was a disaster, um, I went and did product management for a disaster recovery software firm. Uh, that led me into, I had nothing to do with business operations, so that was, that was a good good kind of segue into, I think I'll go do business operations, and on into, my last gig was CTO of a virtualization management company, um, and all of this kind of really has set me up nicely to, to look at the problem of democratic decision making. Now, I understand that I've set an impossibly low bar for confidence for, for most people in this room. Um, but even if you happen to know something about the subject you're taking on, try and lose it. Um, I, and I'm actually serious about that, because one of the problems, if you're taking on a really impossibly hard problem, and these are, these are, some of them are just hard, and others are like impossible. I mean, you can't solve turbulence, you can't solve democracy. I mean, these are just not solvable problems, right? Um, then being an expert means you know the answers, and know, knowing the answers um, either means there wasn't a problem and why are you wasting your time, or those answers are going to get in your way and make it hard to see the new things that you need to see. You need to kind of get stupid. Um, and 
my my last CEO, uh, whom I, I hated with a passion. Um, you know, whenever we were coming up on a release, we would get in a room with him and, and kind of showcase all the stuff we had done, and he would do this Colombo routine. Um, like, you know, I just I'm, I'm not very smart. I, I got to do. Uh, and, it, and, you know, over the course of two or three hours, he would demolish absolutely everything we did by asking really stupid, simple questions. Um, and I think in a number of those areas, I've been able to do some interesting things, and I think it's because I didn't go in with preconceived notions. I didn't, I was kind of that I don't know guy. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I have to keep leaving whatever I've become an expert in, because I know too much and I start to know the answers ahead of time, and that means I can't really innovate anymore. Um, so, once you've nailed stupidity, um, it's time to scale that up. Um, you, you've got to get a team. Um, and this picture, I think, illustrates two things about teams. One, teams are awesome. Like, you can do awesome stuff with teams. It also illustrates one of the most important things about teams, which is when you go out and find five or six or uh, ten people who are just like you, um, this is kind of the, the result you get. <laughs> um, you really need to get out and find people who are different from you. And y yes, that means gender diversity and racial diversity, it, but it means a lot more than that. It's, it's people who think differently, people who come from really different worldviews, it makes it hard, actually. It makes it a lot. When I think of the people I want to work with, they tend to look like me because they, they work like me. Um, and it gets really uncomfortable trying to work with somebody who's really different, comes at it with a different uh, worldview, um, just doesn't follow the rules. <laughs> right? <laughs> and I have a lot of rules, and I think most of us do. Um, but, you know, you start to scale that up, and once again, if you're dealing with a really challenging big problem, it doesn't go very far. You get, you get dullness in the team, uh, and you really, by mixing up, not only does it not, is it not so dull, um, you actually have hope of solving one of these big problems. Um, so. And then comes that magical moment where you did it, right? Like, it, it's starting to work. You've solved something. You've got um, something that's actually interacting with massive numbers of people and doing cool things. And, and there's that really wonderful feeling that you get when it's working. And that's when you need to remember rule number seven, which is um, if you're really dealing with a hard problem, um, either it wasn't so hard because you just solved it and they're kind of defined as things that don't really have a finite solution. Um, or you're going to keep pushing the limits, and what's going to happen is your solution is going to stop, is going to get outside of the kind of the range where it's valid. And you can push those boundaries a couple of times, kind of tweak it and patch it, and then at some point you need to throw it away. And that's where you really need that's where you kind of need the fortitude to, to actually take all of that work, those hundreds of thousands of lines of, of just beautiful code that you've done. And I, over the years, I've, I've found a lot of interesting tools to use. Um, but, but there's a really critical tool that you need to use here. And it's the universal refactoring command, uh, the, the RM dash refactor, uh, where you actually you know, can, can start fresh. Um, and I'll come back to this in a, in a little bit about what exactly we're, you know, a little bit about how you solve it and then, and then why you end up having to re revert back to using this command. So, but to kind of go to the other side, um, you know, this is the kind of the standard, you know, cheer you on, don't stop, you can do it, kind of part of this, and, and that's important. Um, but there's another aspect to not giving up that I think is important. And I learned it very early on, um, kind of accidentally started doing this, this distributed file system thing, which was a lot of fun. Um, and 
I went. I did. I actually did go to the expert. I read the, the Berkeley Fast File System paper, which was the first Unix file system. It was about twenty or thirty years old. Um, that was the only thing I read about file. I, I knew nothing about file systems, but I figured, okay, I'll go to the expert. That's that's good enough. And I went off and I, and I developed all of this stuff. We got it. Um, and at some point, I decided I would actually pay attention and see if anybody else had done anything. And it turns out like there were dozens of research groups around doing distributed file systems. And I got really scared, because some of them were really smart. Um, and they were doing kind of cool things. And over time, I, I learned something really critical, and it's become one of my, my core principles. Um, there's a huge difference between a group that decides to try to solve a problem or decides to research a problem, and a group that decides they're going to solve it. Um, that decision actually makes a huge difference. I mean, all of this, part of the thing is when you're dealing with these massively challenging problems, um, you get into some really fuzzy areas. I mean, these are kind of, and one of them is just the psychology. I'm going to solve it. I don't have a choice. And that's part of what carries you through those barriers that you hit all the time, where it just, it looks completely hopeless. Now, it won't carry you all the way. At some point, you know, you, 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 need, you need this other bit of actually having passion. And one of my startups, um, I've done enough startups now that I have both kinds, the, or all three kinds. I have the pretty nice success. I have the, mm, yeah, um, got, to, got to buy a car. Um, and I have the, wow, that was really, really bad. <laughs> and the worst one I had, it was my, I was the founder and the developer and I had a business partner. Uh, it was about preventing business failure, so it of course, was, of course, had to be one of my failures. Um, and I, I cared about the problem. I was interested in the problem. I was really kind of excited about the, the solution I came up with in, in terms of technology. But it wasn't, it was my business partner's passion. He was the one who couldn't do it full time. And that makes the difference. Like, if it's something I think is fascinating and important and all of that, but I, I cannot do it, then I'm not going to make it. That's one of the things I figured out. Um, and, and it led me in the last year to actually spend a year to wait to find the thing that I couldn't not do. Um, because it's the only thing that's going to carry you through sometimes, um, especially if you get into the, the startup world where not only is the problem hard, but the entire world is against you too, um, especially your customers. Now, you need to think through, as you're looking at a problem, like how do you tell what kind of problem? Is it really hard? Or, and I can't give you a formula. It looks like plug it into the formula. This problem is hard. That problem is not hard. But I did kind of come up with a, a little bit of a, a framework for thinking about this and kind of you know, deciding, OK, what is this, and, and how do I want to react to it? So there's a little bit of a framework and some visual guides that I've prepared for you. Um, as far as I'm concerned, there are only two size problems. There are either, either you, are, you are dealing with some scaling things or you're not. Um, you know, there's no end to that. You just keep scaling up and hitting new levels of problems. But uh, it's either small or large. But there's really three kinds of um, problems. Easy, hard, and wicked. And easy problems are easy. Um, they're the ones where, you know, you slap together a couple of, you know, design patterns, and you solve the problem, and you go home and have a beer and hang out with your partner. It's great. You're saying newborns are small and easy? <laughs> I am small not saying anything about newborns. I'm, I'm, this is this is me when I was solving a, a, a easy problem, oh, a small easy problem. Now, um, the next category is really important. Uh, it's where those of us who are addicted to hard problems go to rest. Right? Those are the the big easy problems. Those are the ones where there's some room to play. Like, and you can actually go out and you can convince people that you're doing something hard. Right? Because it's big. Um, but all it really is is some scope to, to screw around, right? Um, 
yeah, you've got to figure out there's some trade-offs involved and maybe there's 14 answers you know, for the way you can do it, but it's, it's not that hard. I mean, um, it's kind of just a basic engineering task. Um, but it's fun and you can rest and you can impress people with it. And, and so it's a good place to, to go. Hard problems are different. Hard problems don't have answers. Like easy problems have answers. They may have more than one, and that's fine, and you can kind of pick them based on, on things. But hard problems are much more puzzling because they don't have an answer. Um, you've got to do what I'll talk about in a couple of rules um, in order to kind of create an artificial answer. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's, there's uh, small ones. This is me kind of facing one of my early challenges. It's just like you start to go cross-eyed because even figuring out like how you're going to approach figuring out a problem uh, or, or you know making up a solution to this thing that doesn't have a solution is pretty hard. And then there's the last category which you need to learn to stay away from because um, there's no hope there. These are the problems that we can't even agree on what the question is, right? Um, wicked problems, your first task is to get somebody to ask you a question so you can turn it into a hard problem. Because these are hopeless, right? Um, things like uh, poverty. Write a code to solve poverty. Okay, it doesn't. Um, we can't even agree on what, what our definitions of that are, what the questions are. Um, once you get somebody to tell you the question, then you can go in and you can start to uh, puzzle out a solution. Now, this is a fairly standard bit of advice. I mean, users, or if you're a, in a, a, on the business side and a startup customers, their job is to beat the crap out of you until you solve their problem. And, and they're very useful for that. Um, and that's, that doesn't matter if you're doing a hard problem or um, but one of the things that's really interesting is that customers can be the other thing too, or users can be the other thing too. Um, because they can also tell you when something is good enough. We had uh, one, of the, one of the problems that we were, this was actually before me, so I can't take credit for it, but at this virtualization management company, we were, you know, somebody has this large virtual environment few thousand virtual machines running on a bunch of servers and a whole bunch of storage arrays. And they want to know, like they know how much space they have left in their storage. Um, what they need to know is how many more workloads can I put on before I run out of bandwidth. Um, and that, you can't go in and do a command to say how much bandwidth do I have left. Um, some arrays you can kind of figure it out if you get into the detail level, but we're not living at the detail level with this management system. Um, and they're lost because may, you know, I may have room, I may have enough CPU to run another hundred virtual machines, I may have enough memory uh, to do that, but um, am I gonna start bottlenecking on the storage? I don't know. And so what we ended up doing was giving them a completely wrong answer. We just came up with this little guesstimate based on um, pretending like the, the latency we saw was purely the result of the throughput that we saw, which is wrong. It's completely silly. And then doing a linear extrapolation from there. It's wrong. Uh, however, it is, it was wrong in the right way. In other words, it, it tended to underestimate how much bandwidth there was. So we're not telling them to do something dangerous. And it was better than they had, which was, I have no clue. And one of the things that getting involved with a user often has done is, you know, I have, may have no idea how to solve the problem, but I may be able to make <coughs> a user's life enough better or a customer's life enough better that it's good enough. And that's one of the, the major reasons for actually getting tightly coupled to a user is to get them to beat you up, but then also get them to kind of say, all right, we're done. <laughs> you can go home now and rest. And this is my favorite, and it's a little hard to explain. Um, but it's, 
it's kind of like in science. Um, I've said that if you're taking on a really hard problem, one of these ridiculously impossible problems, there's no solution. Um, and so you do what you do in science. Like we don't have, we don't understand how the world works. We have models that we've built that are close enough to the reality. They touch reality in all the places we need them to. Um, that we can work with them and we can do things like build <coughs> airplanes that fly and cars that drive and, and so on. Um, we know they're wrong. We know they do not correspond to reality, um, but they're close enough. And one of the things, I mean, every single thing I've, I've ever done successfully, along with some of the ones I've done unsuccessfully, <coughs> um, I've kind of come to the point where my job that as I see it, is to figure out what paradigm I'm going to, to operate in. What am I going to invent? And it's usually some sort of analogy. It may have something to do with the, the subject area. It may not. Uh, when I had a, you know, the distributed file system, to me, was guys running around with buckets, uh, with bits of transactions, file system transactions. And, and that worked really well for me. It made some of the people we hired look at me oddly. Um, but it became this little world, and if I operated inside of that world, I knew how to get answers. Um, just been going through that on, on kind of dealing with stories and, and communities, and this is kind of the second piece. You build a world, and I'm only three months into the startup. I have now built and torn down three worlds. Um, it's very annoying. Uh, but like in science, you kind of find a paradigm that describes an analogy or something that describes. That paradigm has to be two things. It has to be complete. It has to cover everything you hit. You, you, you're not allowed, but well, you're allowed to do whatever you want on an easy problem because you can kind of fix it up at any point. It's not that big a deal. When you get to one of these hard ones, you're not allowed to marry things that don't go together because you will pay if you do that. Um, so it has to be complete, it has to cover everything, and it has to be completely internally self-consistent, just like a good scientific theory. Um, and then, unfortunately, just like a good scientific theory, like there's, there are some assumptions it's built around. Uh, you get outside the area, of the, the kind of the, the domain in which all the assumptions hold, and you can kind of push it out and push it out and push it out, and at some point, just like with a scientific theory, you can no longer stretch it. You have to actually throw it away and come up with something new. Um, and that kind of takes you back. That's the point at which uh, there are companies and, and developers who kind of survive that process and go out and continue to do something innovative. And then there, there are the ones who get replaced by the new people, uh, whether that's developers, scientists, or, or companies. Um, so you need to, it, it goes back to rule number seven, which is don't claim. Um, and it's really hard because there's this beautiful thing that happens when you find the right paradigm, where you hit a problem and you start to figure out how to solve it and then you realize it's already solved. Like you just kind of line up a couple of elements because your, your whole model is actually designed correctly. And it's this wonderful, you know, heartwarming moment and then at some point you have to kill that baby. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really tough. Anyway, I don't know if this was useful. Um, probably not. But I hope it was at least mildly entertaining. Um, and if you, like I said, the, 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 last, or the first rule really kind of echoes the last rule. If you manage to avoid walking through the door, congratulations, your life is going to be easier. Um, if you don't, then all I can do is just kind of encourage you to, to do, just go ahead and do it. It's fun to at least pretend like you're changing the world and making a difference and doing you know, the hard thing. Um, and that's all I have to say. So thank you.